the thing that's very exciting today is having uh, Dr. Lacey facilitate discussion. The themes brought up in uh, Myra Rock Cooper's Shield of the Republic, I don't want to say too much because this is more for everyone else to enjoy. Um, but what we have here is a fairly optimistic view, not of where America's alliance position is, but where it has been and where it could go. Um, obviously, next month or the next time we have a meeting, which I think will be at the end of this month, will be a very, uh, how to put it, pessimistic view of America's ability to uphold and maintain its alliance commitments. Also, it bears uh, mentioning uh, we're about to have an election tomorrow. Although elections usually don't uh, turn on foreign policy, um, what every single president uh, finds out when he or in the future she uh, gains office is that they want to come in doing a lot of stuff about uh, domestic policy. They find that that is difficult. And then they realize that the thing that they really have power on is foreign policy. Um, so I don't want to sort of go too much about 2016 or talk about this election too much, but it's clear that between, uh, and this is brought up in the book itself, we have uh, President Trump's view on the point of foreign policy being defense of the homeland versus uh, can, uh, Vice President Biden having, let's say, a more traditional view of the role of U.S. foreign policy is to have, as Maya Rapp Hooper puts it, the forward defense of the United States. Uh, so to have a much more robust um, basing strategy abroad, we have a very clear uh, selection in, in this election. So I think without going too much into it, um, because obviously I can hear on for a long time, what I'd like to now do is turn it over to Dr. Lacey, maybe just to give a, a few sort of framing remarks and then really to give it to him in order to facilitate a discussion um, of the of the students who are able to make it today. Um, obviously, Dr. Lacey doesn't need too much of an introduction, uh, so I'll just say he is the wizard of all things military history. So, Doctor, please take it away. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I don't know how many people are online. Yeah, yeah about half a dozen. Half a dozen. Yeah. Um, I don't have a ter I don't have a ton of uh, pre pre programs talks here. I just mostly want to let you guys drive the discussion, and I'll say where I agree, where I don't agree, I and mean, everyone can argue with me, and that makes that makes for a fun room. Sometimes, sometimes it gets a little confusing, but I think we'll we'll handle this. You're all volunteers for this program, correct? This is extra on top of everything you're doing at EWS or CSC. Okay. So I guess I have one leading question is why does the United States have any alliances at all? Or let me bring that back one step. For 150 years, we got fine just fine without alliances. What changed? Or should, or, and should we have allowed it to change? Power projection capabilities. As, as technology evolved and long-range bombers evolved, air campaigns, strategic bombing campaigns became a thing, became within reach of the mainland of the United States. And we, we started realizing, hey, we, we need to keep this fight off of the American homeland. Uh, and it's a lot easier to do, a lot cheaper to do, if we can get indications and warnings from the, the edges of our, our sphere of influence. Okay, that's part of it. I see a hand up. Uh, I think another aspect of that is in the vacuum that existed post World War II. There's a very serious conversation about if we are actually committed to a Marshall Plan, what type of security backing can we also commit to that will actually ensure that the investments we make through the Marshall Plan will ensure that we can protect our security? Okay. Uh, economic globalization is another one. Um, basically, there was no denying that we are integrated with the rest of the world, and our interests no longer were just in our specific sphere of the Western Hemisphere, we couldn't deny it anymore. So we had to ensure that our national interests were looked out for across the world. Okay. So let's, let's, let's go to the present day based on what that, that last comment. That 5 to 6% of our GDP is exports and trade, going back and forth between our country and other countries. And a huge portion of that is goes to Canada and Mexico. China 
what is it, about 40% of its GDP is trade. So they have a much higher stake in a global order that they like than um, the global order we like. Um, does that, does that, uh, does that go badly for us that we can walk away from many areas uh, because they just don't matter to us as much as they matter to China? I, you know, in the sense that the same conversation that for years in almost every state of the union, a president makes a comment about the tech, the oil interests within the Middle East and having that conversation is like, we don't actually import that much oil from the Middle East, but the global market price of oil being affected by a supply chain interdiction or by extension the economies in Europe and in Asia that are affected by that will affect have knock on effects on our own economy. So, so to say, even though we don't necessarily export because we are predominantly a service economy, right. and we a lot of our economy is built around the stock market and around financial futures and around the stability of the global financial system, if there's sudden interruptions in any component of the supply chain, to say that even though our exports aren't affected, it's not to say that our economy won't be affected. Okay. But the the other side of that is China's got just as much interest in a stable or low oil price as we do. Sure. So what do we care if they take over the Middle East to do at the same level or have the same level of relationships in the Middle East as we have had and we pull back? They'll still, still keep a stable price. It's in their best interest. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone else will take the top of the but my, my impression to that effect is not only that we, we're concerned that they would control it, but also that our our other interests in the Middle East will be affected as well. It's not exclusively to say the price of oil is the only thing we're concerned about within within the global international order. It would be hard pressed to think of another one. Fair enough. I mean, <laughs> look at what's happening in Africa right now. We spent a lot of money on AFRICOM, put a lot of top people and foreign into slots over there as as uh, military liaisons. They're all getting pulled back today. You saw that in the news. AFRICOM has disappeared. It's being wrapped into UCOM. It's one of the problems with uh, when you're trying to start not an alliance structure, but even a influence structure, is the powerful party might just walk away from you. What if somebody commits to us and then we walk away? Just something to think about because that's going to come up later. So you have it right i mean there is a big part of it is the strategic impact on the missiles and bombers that can reach us but the first part of it was what um we realized in world war one and world war two that we could not win a war against the continental power another power, great power if we didn't have europe and we and we were going to, and because of that we made decisions to defend europe because we went we we went there in 1917, and again in 1941, we entered wars to save Europe without um, any threat that they could actually come over here, any realistic threat, right? Um, and that threat, obviously, the threat got bigger and bigger. So how do you get past this internet, this national preset or national mental paradigm it's based on, you know, they say George Washington, but, you know, actually Shepard said, no entangling alliances. It's one of the biggest problems we have is convincing America maybe we should have some entangling alliances. It's, it's, it's Trump's position is, you know, walk away from some of these alliances that cost us money. Um, I, I honestly still haven't figured out what Biden's position is going to be. Um, but uh, prior to that, we were willing to lose money on these alliances. So how, how, is there a way past this? And if, if not, are we predetermined to eventually walk away from a lot of alliances because that's our national mindset? That when things get peaceful, we, uh, we run back to isolationism. You guys at home, guys and gals at home can talk also. I, I think that was... One of the consistent themes throughout the book was that, hey, we can't do a design of experiments in international relations and foreign policy, right? We can't set up an experiment and say, hey, this works better than that. But we can, we can look back and, and kind of think, hey, we know what happens. What if something 
something else has happened. And you know, her, her argument throughout the book was, you know, it's, it's cheaper in the long run to maintain these alliances and avoid massive, large-scale, you know, World War II type conflicts. We just we just can't prove that, and it's difficult to communicate that because since post World War II, there hasn't been that massive conflict. Right. I mean, she makes that argument. Is it? Is it? I don't know how well you all know history. Is it supported by history? What's the biggest fear that the great power has when it makes an alliance with a lesser power? Exactly. It's, yeah. it's getting, getting roped into a conflict that you don't, you don't want to be in. Right. And maybe well, that's, well, well. that lower power just wanted to start. Right. So and, and in her book, she says it's, it's really hard to find examples of that. I'm like, well, I don't know why that's true, because you just said one, well, Germany's going to help Austria. Yeah, and I guess I can make an argument that Germany wanted this fight. So it was it, it, I can make a strong argument that Germany wanted this fight. Matter of fact, I'm convinced of it. But uh, if Germany did not want that fight, Austria was continually trying to entangle it in fights that Germany prior to 1914 was in no hurry to get into. Which at some point they're going to make you read the Peloponnesian War in PMA, Thucydides. Do that now. You won't understand the word of it, but you know, after your third or fourth reading, it starts to become second nature. That is the whole thing starts because of an island, Corsaira, that's a colony of Corinth. Sparta could care less about the Corsaira. Athens cares a little, but not for the reasons most people think, and it drags the entire all of the Greek states. And there's two great Greek superpowers dragged into a war because of a small island far from, far from the major theaters of operation. Well, I mean, we just use World War I and the Peloponnesian War as an example, which basically lead into the Thucydides trap. I mean, I know you hate it, but, <laughs> but the examples that were just used as the most common ones to look at were basically examples of that. Great power competition and I mean, there was enthusiasm to go to World War One. Everybody wanted to jump in. I agree with you there. But, I mean, we literally just laid out the Thucydides trap and gave two perfect examples that support it. So, I mean, I'm, I, uh, well, I don't know how much I want to get into the argument. Because it, it, if, if the Peloponnesian War is a, is a Thucydides trap, it is not anything like Dr. Gra uh, Dr. Allison has described um, Athens wanted the war, not Sparta. Uh, Germany wanted a war. It had absolutely nothing to do with the rising power of the German fleet against the British. That Germany wanted a war for other reasons. So it is the exact opposite of how a Pisidian traps defined. You have to read my whole essay. I, I guess I have to read the essay. I, yeah, well. I had to read about it. In, <laughs> I had to read about it in a seminar, and the way it was, yeah. the way we laid out the Peloponnesian War was very much like I know. I don't think either of them really wanted to go to war, based on what I was told in that last seminar I did with it. But they were, I mean, they yeah. were in competition, and I thought it sounded more like Sparta wanted to go more than Athens. From I mean, but I guess it's all about who you're reading historically, what, what scholar you're reading. I, I would say all the leading scholars of the Peloponnesian War, Kagan, Hansen, Paul Ray, all, all say the opposite. But I do understand that, the, that Sparta wanted to go to war because of, you know, the rising power of Athens is the predominant uh, thing out there in the in the in the wider circles, um, I don't believe I don't believe a word of it, and uh, maybe we'll come back to that at the end of the day. Um, I can send out the article as well, all of you. All right. Right. You, want. You, do I, you do. Send me a note. I'll resend it to you. What were you gonna say? No, I just, uh, the extension that she's responding exactly to the city trap in the book, saying never once throughout our entire history with these alliances have we been wrapped into a conflict that we didn't actually one as a country. And so, and she's also like, the only time that this alliance has ever actually been activated right. twice, once for um, Sarajevo as well as for, I'm uh, sorry, for Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, Yugoslavia, and the second time for obviously the invasion 
of Afghanistan. Those two times, the United States, the predominant member in the partnership, forced the weaker members of the partnership to join in the conflict that the stronger member right, wanted. If they don't want to do it, they don't do it. What does Article 5 commit you to? I don't have a friend. Is it, uh, in the NATO alliance, if, if the Baltics get invaded and they all call and they, an Article 5 event, what does everyone have to do? Or collect the weapons of self-defense. Collect the what? Self-defense. Define that for me. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, that's the trick with the uh, Estonian cyber attack where they claimed Article 5. They did they not. They had no idea how to respond to that. They didn't, plan, they didn't make it Article 5 thing. They did something else, Article 4 or something lower. I have to go back and look at it. They did Article 5, it would have been a crisis within NATO because we would have had no idea what to do. Um, Article 5 doesn't commit you to much. You know, it, it could be, you know, and I sat there, DOD war game, with uh, some very senior people from the Baltics. Invasion happened, they declared Article 5, and they were wondering when the BCTs and the regiments and the U's and all that would show up. Right? What do you mean it doesn't show up? You know, there's got to be some, there's a lot of stuff that's going to go on. Maybe we can talk them into falling back before we have to commit forces. Germany might just decide to make a nasty editorial and say it's better it's Article 5 commitment to the support of this ally in the war. There's nothing in Article 5 that says the BCTs will show up in the, you know, within the week and start retaking the country. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alliance a lot of ways out of it. Um, for everybody who doesn't really want to commit too, too heavily. Doctor, um, Dr. Lacey, uh, Dr. Rover had a question. He just typed in. He's got construction noise, so he's typing. Um, he also threw in the Article 5 text here for those who want to see it. But he's asking, uh, great powers are afraid of being roped into a complex shot by the weaker ally, but do you believe this describes how the U.S. got into Vietnam via France's original interest in Indochina? Um, I'm not the Vietnam expert by any means, but I... I I do not believe France did it. I mean, I think we we believed in the domino theory. We believed that this was just one more step on the road of international communism. We saw it as part of a greater Russian slash Chinese plan to uh, hit us at the peripheries and see what we what we would tolerate, what we would not tolerate. Um, you know, we do have have uh, some of these things take on a life of their own. We have uh, Kennedy, just before he's assassinated, saying, what do I do about Vietnam? And General Taylor saying, get out, because I know I have to get out. How do I do it? The American people are watching now. You have Johnson coming in and doubling down. Uh, and then it became a matter of some course. We've invested so much, but, uh, you know, which is one of my pet peeves in strategic thinking. I'm mean, Totally convinced we're in Afghanistan today because of some course. My question is, my, my response is always, if you could not go there today, if we had nothing in Afghanistan, is there something there that would force us to deploy 15,000 troops and all the support that's needed? And the answer is no, then get out. You don't have a strategic reason to be there anymore. Um, I, a small argument can be made to, sh to say, hey, um, we have to show our allies that we will stick with them to the end. Not my question, follow-on question to what you just said. So what about um, secondary effects? So, I mean, say we don't have anything directly in Afghanistan, but Iran and Russia have interest in Afghanistan also, obviously. And if we pull out, Iran will probably, which they've already started to do, will attempt to jump in. So, I mean, do you mean overall or do you mean direct? As a strategist, I would hope that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love to see Iran bogged down in Afghanistan for 20 years. I would love to see Russia reinsert itself into Afghanistan and get bogged down again as a strategist. So, you human, humanitarian, I might have some problems with it. But as a strategist, I'm like, you can't be that insane. You to do to think you're, things are going to go well for you in there. No, no, but I mean, yeah. it was more the, just an example. Like, so, um, I, mean, I mean, you don't want to be seen running away. And we were always, we were afraid of that in Vietnam very much. Not only was it a domino effect, there was, 
how is this going to look to our other alliance partners? Korea, not alliances so much, but powers that we have negotiated some sort of an arrangement with. How is Korea going to feel, or Taiwan going to feel, if they see us abandoning Vietnam? Um, the way we got past that was to double down on those commitments and then to rebuild our military forces under Reagan. We, we, we became totally focused on how do we stop the Russians from coming through to pull the gap. And we rebuilt our military in terms of morale. Things like that. We, we moved into a superpower that was didn't know its direction to a superpower that was really pushing, pushing people around. And then we win, we win the Cold War and we, and we become a hyperpower. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's gives and takes in all of this, but you have to, I mean, if there's one thing you walk away from with uh, Dr. Cooper's book is that what they used to call the Lippman Gap, and she mentions Lippman. You got so many resources, you got so much you want to do, and someplace in there there's a gap that where there's not enough resources to do everything you want to do, and you have to orient what's crucial, what's critical. Now, I'm an old guy, so I remember the Falklands campaign. And uh, well, I was in the 82nd at the time, and a whole bunch of Brits came over to explain what they did and how they did it. And, and I was like, wow, you know, I, was a, I think it was a first lieutenant, and uh, what a great campaign. You guys did marvelously, you know, we just talked about it all the time. And then some colonel says, you know what, if we walked away, we know what the Russians walked away from from that? Is that Britain, if, we, if we're going to go to, if we're going to go to war with, the, uh, with NATO, the first thing we're going to do is start a little fight with the, between the Argentines and the British and watch the entire British Navy and half of its army head to the South Atlantic so we won't have to play with it anymore. Um, in terms of alliances, you don't think Russia, you know, one of the reasons Russia doesn't close down our transit points through Uzbekistan is they love seeing us waste resources in Afghanistan from a strategic point of view. Um, you know, it, it's ugly. It's not the humane answer. But we love seeing Russia tied down in Syria from a strategic point of view. They are beginning to find out how much an expeditionary force costs. You know, the, it's terrible for Ukraine, but Russia is bogged down in Ukraine and it's costing them billions of rubles they can't afford. But uh, if you're a realist and you uh, think it in these terms, you know, and you all heard my commentary on One Belt, One Road, I, I, if someone in the Pentagon said, Dr. Lacey, put together a list of 20 countries you want China to throw its money away on, China's got a better list than I could have put, put together. Um, anyway, let's get off the soapbox. What the let, I think the Lippman Gap is, is the most important thing in alliances, right? The, and we're going to come back again to alliances. Alliances getting ourselves getting us in trouble. But um, a nation's commitments and a nation's power have to be in uh, in sync. And there's got to, according to him, there's got to be a huge reserve left over, left a power reserve that isn't committed to one alliance or another alliance or some action that has to happen. So if, if you have enough to, you know, you've got, you're committed in Asia and you're committed in NATO, and you have enough to fight in one theater, you, you, you have a giant litman gap between your alliances there. Um, is there, is there a solution? We can't decommit. Or do, we, or do you think we have enough resources to take on China and Russia at the same time? In a non-nuclear fight. Yes. Everything else, that we got to qualify that. I guess it's the, the question of what, what scale those fights will be at. And if we're talking full-scale World War III, get everything out, fully mobilize the nation, then probably no. Not without our alliances, but it's that's the entire conversation is can NATO maintain a deterrent ability to prevent escalation beyond a certain point? And same with our alliances in, in the Pacific. Can, they, can we deter to prevent beyond a certain point where we can no longer sustain this fight without excessive investment of resources? 
allies. I mean, it's the only way to cover down, really. If they come. If they come, that and I mean, it's kind of a trade off, isn't it? I mean, they give us, we give them. So, I mean, we give them security, they give us spacing. I mean, without that, we don't really, we can't. There's no way we could cover down. Okay, so that brings us to the whole forward defense argument. Sure. Is Trump right? So I get political about this. Just, I mean, he's made a big point. I'm going to walk away from alliances that you don't, you don't, the burden sharing isn't fair or equitable. Is he right? As a strategist, is it, is, look at it from a strategic viewpoint, not a political viewpoint. Should they, nations of Europe, undertake more of the burden? If the answer is yes, do we walk away? If they do not, two, there's two separate things now. I, I think the answer is no. But no, no to the first, and I, I say no to walking away. Certainly, you want to you want to have a conversation with your allies about them increasing their investment. But Hooper makes a very clear argument in here that I agree with that, like walking away from these alliances, like getting rid of Ramstein Air Base and getting rid of our forward presence in, in NATO, or getting rid of all our bases in the Pacific. The amount of money that we then translate in, into when we have to mobilize on the back end, if we ever have to reinsert into theater, is so excessive that the I think the conversation is very much in favor of maintaining our alliances, for, even if for just the sake of forward deployment. So, does it have to be alliances, or can it be more transactional in nature, almost? I mean, I don't want to say proxy us, but I mean. Alliances are based on, you know, security and, you know, coming to someone's aid if need be a lot of times. And what if it's just purely transactional, like money uh, or uh, trade-offs? I'm just saying, I don't I, know. I, if I, would, I would say you're seeing, because we don't have a real, we don't have a NATO-like structure in the Pacific. We have SATO, which I think amounts to much. Um, but you see it a little more transactional there. And I think you see transactional a lot coming from the Chinese side. You know, one belt, one road, or any loans, or we're going to come in and buy up all your commodities is a very transactional thing. Um, so there is a problem with the transactional portion. If the money stops, the person, the, the, the everything is over. So an African country is happy to take a billion yuan. <clears throat> and they'll look for a million more yuan. And we have done this too. I mean, it, we would do it as a nation with unilateral loans, unilateral aid, or um, for the IMF and the World Bank. Um, it's all it's all meant to to influence. Uh, obviously, we want to help people and we want to bring them into the global trading community. But at a strategic level, it's influence. And now. China's finding out that the countries can't pay them back, and they're learning they're, they're in national crisis, and they have to debt crises repeated, uh, going to be repeated over and over uh, for out there one belt one road commitments. Um, and then the Chinese are like, well, if you don't if you don't uh, pay back pay us back, we're going to take we're going to do what the treaty said, we're going to the negotiation said. So far, they're getting away with that for a couple of small countries. But when Pakistan says, no, you're not, there's nothing they could do unless they want to put troops on the ground in Pakistan. And Pakistan might say, we want you to, you know, re, re what's the word they use for uh, loans? Um, refinance. Yeah, refinance, re, reset the loan, you know, give us longer payment tips, what the IMF and the World Bank do, excuse me, um, reset the loan. Uh, but and uh, we want you to make new loans to us. And the Chinese say no. Pakistan says okay. Who else wants to play with us? Uh, transactional is what you have to do. I would argue that even NATO, to a huge degree, is transactional for the people in Europe. Um, over here on these. Uh, so I guess for the first question and no to the second. So I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with saying hey. By, by this metric percentage of GDP, we want everybody to, to share the burden. Right. So either either meet that metric or come up with a better metric to explain, 
hey, maybe it's, it's our defense budget is it this percentage of GDP, but it, you know, she talks about it in, in a couple spots of, hey, but we're making these other investments in national infrastructure that allow, you know, roads or railways across Europe, which will better facilitate mobilization if Article 5 was invoked right. and, and we're going to defend the full gap, right? So I, I don't see any issue at all with the President of the United States saying, hey, but in, increase your, your funding and your commitment to, to the same level that we're doing, or explain it to me in a better metric that I agree that we are equally burdened. And they are definitely trying that better metric. Anyone been assigned to UCOM yet? Someday you're going to go to one of you or two of you may land up in UCOM and you're going to have to either do or look at a mobility analysis and lie. When you, when you look at the UConn mobility analysis of what it's going to take to move an armored division from Germany or France or the De Netherlands, wherever it lands, into Poland, it's a nightmare. They're not doing that kind of stuff. They're saying, hey, here's the metric because we do this, this, and this. But if, if you say prove it, that becomes a whole new world. But in, 18, in 1949, when we started NATO, what could the NATO countries contribute to that? Almost none. Not much. They were battered. We started NATO because it was in our interest to start NATO. It was in our interest to put forward deployed forces in there. Um, Dr. Weber had a comment, too. Go ahead. Okay, so it's up on the screen for those who can see it. But um, as considered the Dr. Lacey's original question, but also framing it in a different <laughs> angle. So. Does a collection of transactional relationships constitute an alliance? If yes, why bother with writing down alliance commitments? If no, what's the value of losing on these relationships? I will, I will leave that to you all for the first iteration. My, my take on it is that there's a, transactional relationships, I've seen this actually pan out in reality in, in theater, is transactional relationships very much turn into a breakdown in trust. There is no trust when you have a transactional relationship. Show me the money and I will do the thing. Um, where or on the other side, you're saying an alliance, I've committed on paper that if something happens, I will do this. It's, it's agreeing to a potential possible future that we that might show up and when it does, I have confidence in that the reality that you will come to call and do what you said you will do, which is much more in the, in the realm of influence and trust and relationship between two partners or two countries by the, the very step-by-step, -step, show me this much money, I will do X for you. Give me more money, I will do more for you. I think that's the distinction in my mind. I think it also has to do with the vagueness of the promise, <laughs> uh, saying that you will come to someone's aid if you are attacked. What does that constitute? I mean, unless there's specifics written down about how you will um, help them, I mean, what can you really say that they're doing or not doing? And I think a lot of those alliances, the way things are written, and a lot of times, like you said for NATO, it's vague. I mean, it's not really, really vague, but it's, it's somewhat, <laughs> it's somewhat, okay, somewhat vague. So, I mean. All right, so if I'm answering this, looking back, or look at, even looking forward, alliances have an alliance structure. A transaction is one transaction, or it's 100 transactions. Transactions over the engagement ends. Alliances bring to it a, one, some burden share, which we may or may not get back to. Two, um, some consultation, or a lot of consultation on shared problems, and a lot of planning. Whenever you have an alliance, you almost, and I'm talking a military alliance, which NATO is definitely is, you have shared planning, you have shared um, standard uh, ways of operating. I'm not saying they're perfect, uh, we all know they're not, but they keep, they keep at it. There's tremendous amount of confidence building measures all the time. You know, hey, I'm moving a battalion, you know, we're gonna do these two battalion exercises with your battalions, Close in this space, but we want to open one here. Um, there's continuous interaction to build up that trust in the military and odds. But it still is, you know, as many evil uh, dictators have said, it's just a piece of paper. 
countries, to quote Lord Palmerston, don't have friends. They have interest. Nobody's going to stay in an alliance or meet an alliance commitment that is against their interest, or rarely. And alliances, if you stick to them, can easily run out of control. I mean, the entangling alliances of World War One is what everyone's always afraid of. And Britain does not have an alliance with France. It has an entente. We were so scared of alliances when we came into World War One. What did we call ourselves? We weren't an allied power. France and England allied for the war, but we didn't. We were an associated power because we didn't want to use the word alliance because it comes with a whole bunch of political baggage that would have to go to Capitol Hill. Um, and so now, when you're doing, you know, you know, you see, you see this in in. Um, Asia to a huge degree right now, right? Japan, we have a, we, a self-defense agreement. We do not have a military alliance with Japan, but we have constant interaction in um, building up those trust measures. And that, you know, and the day Japan decides that our nuclear can, oh, nuclear umbrella cannot be counted on, Japan goes nuclear. It's not going to take them a year. Probably, they probably could do it in a month, if that long. They have all the technology, they have the ingredients, it's just a matter of snapping it together. Um, you know, and if we have to ask ourselves another question there. How, a non-nuclear power that could go nuclear literally overnight is a nuclear power. Um, it just doesn't declare itself as such yet. Uh, South Korea, we, have a, we don't have an alliance with South Korea, or do we? I don't think we do. We have... We will protect you, um, and we do, and by keeping a uh, good a good portion of second division there. And we used to, I don't know how much Air Force power we have there anymore. Naval operations and putting Patriots in and fads. We're proving that day in day out. Uh, China is having a hell of a time building up an alliance structure, as is Russia. <clears throat> Their, their growth in power is forming, I don't want to call it, because I don't know why it's, but China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Philippines wavering in and out. I don't know what's going on with those people. Uh, I should call those people that country. Um, Japan, they're all talking. They're all integrating. They're all, how do, we, how do we hold back China together? And the United States could do a lot better. I mean, the, one of the things we have to do when we're looking at alliances is realizing that everything counts. Walking away from the specific trade agreement, that, that he was looking at it as just a trade agreement, when to the rest of the thing, it was like, ooh, this is, the, this is a really big step towards an alliance with the United States to keep China in check. They were looking at it as a geopolitical um, initiative of some importance, which was a lot more than trade. It was just trade that they, they, <clears throat> they can get by on one-on-one -on -one trade agreements with the United States or working for the World Trade Organization. This spent a lot more to the Pacific than just trade. It meant the United States was joining a team to, to, to China. China loved that we walked away from the TPP. Is that what it's called? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hmm? We'll be back. Can't stay stupid forever. And it was good. It was a good agreement. <laughs> anyway, um, let's go back to the burden share because it is the biggest argument out there, especially if the NATO. If NATO stopped paying anything towards its own defense, or it built up its European defense initiatives and separated it from NATO, should we stay? Yes. Okay. Um, but what advantage do the United States have? Europe is Europe is wealthier than the United States. It can beat Russia on its own if it if it if it decides to consolidate military forces budget and really create a European military force. It could take on Russia. 
Yeah. What's Russian GDP per year? Anyone? It's about one point two trillion dollars a year. Is that right, Dr. Weber? One point two, one point four trillion? I'll say yes. He's not arguing with me. One point six. One point six. Look at a list. That puts it really close to Brazil. It is not an economic superpower. Brazil's a strong nation, but Brazil cannot take on Europe in a fight. They are, they are playing a very weak economic hand incredibly well. Um, or, depending on how you look at it, incredibly foolishly. If they had adopted the economic policies Poland did after, the, for, after 1989, they'd be three times as rich. They, they, they are wasting so much money on adventurism that they're keeping their country purposely poor. Um, someone in the virtual realm want to weigh in here? I thought I heard someone cue the mic up. Yeah, that was, that was me, what? sir. Uh, for Europe taking on Russia, I just am a, a little skeptical that even a unified Europe would be able to take on Russia because I think there's so much more to the conflict that's not economic, right? Yes, Russia economically is a lot weaker than I think a lot of people give them credit for, uh, but that could that could change, right? If Russia moved away from hydrocarbons and and modernizing the economy, they could they could do different things. But the, you're not going to fight the war in the stock market, right? You're going to fight the war in Europe, which Russia borders. Do you, I mean, like, does that matter at all to you, or not really? I'm not, uh, if I'm understanding the question, you, 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 I think you're setting up another avenue here. I'm saying, let me let me change what I'm saying. Then Germany is four times wealthier than Russia is. Germany wants to rearm; it can easily outspend, outequip its forces. Now, does it have the willpower to do that? No, probably not. If the United States walks away. Would they do it? And they'll forget, as a, as Frenchman said. I believe it was a Frenchman. The purpose of uh, NATO is to keep the U.S. in, the Russians out, and Germany down. And uh, if we, you know, if, if, if we depart and Germany does get scared and rearms, it becomes the colossus in Europe again, which scares everybody in Europe. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I guess just like in the Great Depression, the Soviet Union was significantly weaker economically than Nazi Germany. And at the end of the Second World War, the Soviet Union rolled up Nazi Germany. So I just don't look at Russia's economic weakness as a, as a limiting factor for their ability to credibly threaten all of Europe. Is that, is that a fair point, do you think, or, or not so much? Um. It's a good point. I don't know if it's a fair or honest or correct point. Um, Russia came out of the, um, the, the during the Depression was probably economically equal, if not ahead of Germany in many areas. Uh, Germany was not near as economically strong going into World War II as Popular, popular narratives would have us believe. I mean, they still attacked the Soviet Union with 500,000 horses uh, to carry their supplies. If, you, if this is a topic that interests you or interests anybody else, I strongly suggest you read Adam Tooze's book, Wages of Destruction, which will tell you all you need to know about the German economy before, during, and, to, and the, you know, not quite, quite as much after the war. But uh, Germany is an economic baggage case, basket case. Um, and Russia has tremendous industrial capacity, but it still would have lost without Lend-Lease. Uh, we supplied almost all their trucks, all their food, all the aluminum that was being used to build their Air Force, a good portion of, of the steel that went into their T-34s and KV-1s and all the rest of it. Uh, and more importantly than anything else, their food. Germans own their breadbasket, the Ukraine. We fed them. We don't get near as much credit for that. There's some good, good analysis out there of 
um, how much you know, how much the Soviet Union owed to U.S. and British lend lease, which just got more and more crucial as they went into the offensives. Um, go ahead. Uh, I just, just to get back to your point about why it's important to stay in NATO, regardless of uh, you know how the it plays out with uh, contribution of, of money, is that uh, by us getting out of NATO, that would uh, you know this whole thing is about great power competition below armed com conflict. If you don't have the United States and Europe uh, you know, in some sort of alliance, and there's the Greece deterrent power, which makes it all the more likely that actual conflict could occur. Um, and, and then, you know, that, that vagueness that we talked about with Article 5, um, you know, that, that's, um, that, that vagueness can, can help with the, the okay. terms just to say, like, oh, I don't know what they're going to do on the Russian. So let's be on the, let's be on the thing here. I am a strong believer in NATO, and I want us to stay in there, whether they give us a dime or not. But I prefer that they give us lots of dollars. Um, <clears throat> the problem, if I'm, if I'm, the problem I have with the Trump approach is he brought the fight into the open, and maybe he doesn't have to. But if you got to bring it into the open, I can make a strong argument to stay in NATO, and we're picking everyone home, and that's going to that's going to save us a lot of money. We're going to fill Fort Hood up. There's still some space there to put a couple of divisions in, and if you want us to come back in an emergency. You better have the ports ready, the roads ready, and the airfields ready, and we will come back. But if you don't do that, you have made it impossible for us to come back. Would you buy into that? I would say no. But what's the difference between that and offshore balancing in an alliance? But, I mean, the purpose of NATO is not necessarily to do offshore balancing, in the sense that, for one, the forward presence of our forces gives us platforms to project power. And it also minimizes the cost of the initial blunt force that goes in to prevent the expansion of whatever opening there is from the Russians. And, and then by extension, if you sit there and, and back it up and say, is it in the American interest to be forward? And, and I think Cooper makes a good point two ways. One, in that he wants predominance of the fight to be happening, obviously, in Europe. And then secondly, is it in the American interest to have a united Europe that is that can both counterbalance Russia and counterbalance the United States? That's independent. I think NATO. that's going to happen eventually, anyway. Well, I didn't do away with NATO. I just I'm, I am not a proponent. And the second division has already moved up to the border. That's a trigger. Um, but if we put the second division in Australia, say if you have trouble, we'll come, uh, or someplace else. That's that's sort of offshore balancing. Some people want to take it fair, but we could get the, from Fort Hood to sec, to Korea just as fast as we can get from Australia to Korea. Um, it's a lot of money. A lot of quick the empathy, a lot of, of the initial fighting on our ally or associated power, um, and it gives us maneuver room. It's a famous quote where the British said, how many troops are you going to want to fight the Germans initially? And I think it was General Folk who replied, one, and we will do our best to get them killed because he's going to become a cause celeb in England. And everyone, oh, we have, to, we have to avenge that death. That's, that, 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 is, that is to a large degree. Poland, you know, if we put a battalion in Poland or, or a brigade on a rotating basis, that's not going to stop the Soviet Union. That's a tripwire. Lose that brigade, and the United States is coming into the war. It's how they guarantee that they will not be abandoned. Because the other side of entanglement is what? Abandonment. We have put all our chips into the United States or our other ally coming to help us, and suddenly they don't. I think another problem with the whole concept of offshore balancing is, is assuming you're going to be able to get in once the war kicks off. If, if we're having that conversation about 
memory denial, anti-access in the modern fight, you have to be there before the war starts. Otherwise, you can't really fight in. And, and that's all our current operating concepts are built around inside force helps outside force fight in. So what if we change our concept to if we can't get in, you can't get out? If A2 and D2 is so, so terrible and horrible and so expensive to overcome in terms of treasure and casualties, what if we defend, <clears throat> what if we defend Korea, um, South Korea from, or Taiwan? What if we defend Taiwan from Japan and Guam or Singapore? China, I, God, you took Taiwan and you've got all these A2D2 capabilities and we can't get in. But I've got A2D2 capabilities all along the first or second island chain and now you can't come out. You're stuck there. You can't trade anymore. And by the way, the new oil can't come into you either because we're not letting it. We, we, is that is that a is it a viable option? Yes, probably. But is it a smart option? Is it another way of looking at this? It's, it's probably not all we got right now. Is that we have, until we until we solve that A two A D problem, for example, I'm wrong, I that the, the Corbett approach, the, the blockade on the, on the second island chain, uh, and holding someone in. As long as we don't have a solution to get through AUAD, what else is it? It's basically what we did in World War II. Hold the perimeter until we have a solution to break through the German Copas Berenger. Stop them at Midway. Stop them at Guadalcanal. Stop them in, uh, in New Guinea. Um, you know, just hold that line. And maybe a year and a half from now, we'll have the resources to, to move forward. But that could be done through offshore balancing. We're not a tripwire anymore. We have room to maneuver. I'm arguing, I'm arguing a point I don't agree with, which is uncomfortable for me, but go ahead. It seems to me we'd still be vulnerable to say a company, and then if we did achieve, you know, pursue, like say we wouldn't fight in to take Taiwan, but we pursue that strategy of, all right, fine, well, no more shipping uh, for China. That would just be a sim probably one step closer to escalation, which of course right. are a lot of control. So I think that's probably not a viable. But the evil way can escalate. Put the 101st and a and a met and a U into Taiwan and losing them, or losing a carrier that comes in to support you, we start the escalation process also. Um, let's bring it back away from the doctrine and talk the the alliance structure. Uh, how did they, you know, for Taiwan, we don't have an alliance because we we're afraid that they would do, they would just keep hammering the Chinese when Mao had, it was still trying to get the country organized and drag us into another fight that we didn't want. Um, we're still afraid of that, aren't we? We're begging them all the time. Do not declare that you're an independent country because that's, what the Chinese have told us that's the red line. When they do that, we're coming. Um, How much more dangerous of it is if we say, you know, we're going to forward the plot? I mean, turning Taiwan into a float and missile base is an incredibly powerful thing. Not being there also tells the Chinese, this is a big weakness of offshore balancing. The Americans aren't here. They don't care as much. Without that trigger, we could do something, pay the comp play, and go to the negotiating table and force the Americans to continue the war with all the international pressure that will, you know, there's a word that gives a letter O, but I'm not sure I can pronounce it. Or, or, I can't pronounce it, so I won't say it. It's a word I've read that I've never said out loud before. I'm going to go home and practice it. <laughs> O-P-P, you know the word I'm talking about? It's a word, that, that's a word you guys haven't read yet. Um, sure, control. All right, so if you don't have an alliance, so a lot of people want to do away with them in favor of what? What's the alternatives to alliances? What can you count on to keep the peace? Kind of relationship? You That's have, pretty close to alliance. But, I mean, if the full count balance would be unilateralism, you, you go it alone, which is... All right, so that's... An, uh, uh, an autarkic situation. I don't know if this, I don't know if autarky works for 
a geopolitical stance. The only way autarky is, autarky is when a country is independent. And Germany tried to do this prior to World War II. It didn't want to count on getting oil, food, anything from anyone else. It wanted to be able to supply everything it needed from its own resources. When it could not supply from its own resources, they would go out and conquer, and that would be part, become part of a greater Germany. Japan's co prosperity sphere is built on war talking. China, what we see in China today has a tremendous amount of war talking elements, and it's, it, it comes very close to mercantilism in a, in a, in a, in a, in a economic sense. So, so China doesn't have any oil or sufficient oil and gas to run a modern economy. It, it, it wants that. What the rest of the world is afraid of the United States is with Canada and the United States together, we are as close as any nation could ever be to our talking without having to conquer anyone else. Just about everything we need to be a superpower is within our borders. Oil, gas, rare earth elements. It costs more than us than China, but we have them all. There's probably only, I think, one element that isn't inside the U.S. borders in sufficient quantities for us to get if we want to pay the money. We could feed ourselves. So few nations can feed themselves. It's incredible. Um, it's, so we can walk away from the world, and, tip, and if the world doesn't bother us, say, and if you do bother us, we're going to nuke you. We could be an autarkic nation. We wouldn't be as rich as we would be because you get rich by trade and, and integrate paid out there with the rest of the world. But uh, China cannot be an autarkic nation. Russia with the Ukraine could probably be very close to autarkic. Dr. Weber? Yeah, as I hopefully the, there's construction noise. That's why I've been on mute. Um, the Soviet Union operated as an autarky for several decades, so it has practice in that. And the current government of Russia, like the governments of Russia during the Soviet Tsarist period before, um, one of the things that they developed, all of them, uh, is a level of state-led coercion that allows basically the low levels of wealth and consumption to be a garrison state in case that's what Russia's leaders need. So the Russians are willing to accept being less rich in, turn, in exchange for being more secure. So they have experience doing this. There you go. All right. So going back to the alternatives portion of this, the alternative, there's, there's, the strategic alternative is forward engaged. This is from the military viewpoint, forward engaged or offshore balancing or not engaged at all. Those are the three major options. But there is a whole giant community out there, and I'm, I'm talking huge community, that says we should rely on international law and institutions such as the United Nations um, to maintain peace, to form trade. And we've, and we've built up a number of these organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, the the World Trade Organization, which was originally the uh, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, the, the GATT, um, these are all institutions that are outside, or supposedly outside of the control of any um, single nation, and they're supposed to replace the need to go to war. We. You know, the, the, the League of Nations, collective security, was going to replace the alliance structure. The collective security, when they create the League in 1919, 1920, 21, was going to replace the alliance structure that led to such a terrible result in World War I. And how'd it go? Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it didn't, it didn't let Japan, it didn't let Germany in. It didn't, uh, the Russians didn't come in initially, I don't believe. Uh, and, okay, then the, then the UN comes. I had an argument a long time ago with somebody who said, you know, most Americans would be very happy to see the UN sail off into the sunset. Why would they want it in New Jersey? 
Um, anyway, he didn't get it at the moment. It takes, some people it takes a few seconds. Uh, but is the UN doing a better job? Or nuclear, or nuclear weapons doing a better job because you get down, they both came into being approximately at the same time. If the, what, what does the UN, what, what makes the UN, and, and Jim Lacey, who doesn't like all this collective thinking, why do I still put collective, uh, is there a good word here that I'm missing out on? Um, you know, what, you know, the UN is going to be just as important as, just as, it's going to be the League of Nations, but more capable. It's got some advantages. It builds a security council. But with the advent of nuclear weapons and the UN together, the UN does something that makes it work keeping. Even when they let all these really horrible nations into the human rights, to run human rights organizations, even when the General Assembly votes against us all the time, it does something Worthwhile. Anyone want to shoot? Provides a way for people to talk to each other, so our only resort is in nuclear warfare. That's very close to what I have in mind. An armative body. What? An armative body. An armative body. Okay. Um. Yeah. If you, if the United States and Russia are rushing towards war because of certain geopolitical things, and we keep telling the Russians, "Don't do this." It's literally impossible for them not to, 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 to listen to us because their people, we're not going to listen to the Americans if they have a gun to our head. But the UN could come in and say, hey, let's step back and take a look at this. The UN gives a fig leaf to nations, great powers, to do something they want to do anyway, and they just can't do it within the, within the diplomatic or political context in which they are living. You know, they, they, Khrushchev and Kennedy came to an agreement, and it, it, it was close. But the UN said, hey, we want you, you know, we passed the resolution, you have to come talk to us. And both the United States and Russia said, well, that's a little better than a war. We'll put it over in the UN. It, le it gives you a fig leaf that you otherwise can't do. And that's worth its weight in gold. You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter how, you know, when we get into a a shooting war with China, and it is spiraling towards World War III, and we tell the Chinese, stop or else, and they say, screw you or else, there has to be an outside organization that gives, gives them a fig leaf. If they tell the UN, go away, means they don't want the fig leaf, they want war. Um, and that tells us something, too. Because um, yeah, in the in future wars, you don't have to be talking to your allied partners, you got to be talking to your enemies. You have to be negotiating throughout the war to make sure that they no one no one misinterprets something or and uh, next step is nuclear release. But how much faith do we want to put in these organizations? If, if the, there is a huge bodies in Europe and the United States and other nations said. You know, let's let's put our faith in peace. Let's put our faith in the, in the structures we have built and disarm. You wearing uniforms can immediately see the stupidity of this. But how do you explain that to somebody else? That's a The deterrence back on that force is negative. The long short of that argument. And if if I have if I make it so that war is so destructive that it's not worth it, it's effectively deterred that option from the table. We are then forced to the negotiating table to then work inside these bodies that are the UN, which then facilitates them essentially. Okay. I understand. I think I understand what you're saying. If we all disarm, it only works if everybody does it and if you don't have armaments to enforce the disarmament, then there's no way to make everybody participate in that disarmament. Yeah. Do you understand how unusual it is that so many countries, even they hate us, trust us with nuclear weapons? Even though we're the only country that's ever used them? Yeah. 
Nobody, nobody ever wakes up in the morning and says, I wonder if the U.S. is going to nuke me today. Um, it's, 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 it's almost surreal that, we, that everyone is fine with us having 7,000 or several thousand nuclear weapons and doesn't wake up in the morning. Anyway, uh, what time is it? Uh, 2.35. How much? We've been at this for what? About an hour. All right, let's uh, look at two closing things I want to bring up. Um, in a competition environment, what do you do when your alliances become targets? In a gray zone, how, what, is, what does Russia and China want to do to strip away our allies or influence our allies not to come and support us? Or, and how do, we, how do we combat that? How do we think about alliances in a competition? We know how we think about them in war. They're all going to come help us. But how do you think about alliances in a prolonged, multi-decade competition? I think actually Exit from Hedemony had a good uh, session on this and how do world orders unravel. Right. And he's sitting here saying it's about wedging and then renegotiating with, with, with the maneuver space that's created by that wedge. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of whatever your opponent is doing is he's competing to create this wedge between you and your ally, and then trying to renegotiate a better deal with that ally now that he's created a wedge between you and them. Which has been Russia's problem. They don't have a better deal to offer. But China might have a better deal to offer, or thinks it does. Um, so our economic model is superior, because look what happened to them in 2008. Uh, the capitalist countries. Um, the difference is our two main competitors, we have no one to wedge. Russia doesn't have an ally, unless you want to count Syria or Iran. I mean, they're just, that's, that's a very transactional environment for Syria and Iran. We would be finished if we don't have, if we don't do what Russia says. There was a Turkey became a very interesting spot. Um, you know, they bought the, the uh, what is it, 400, yeah, what is it called? S-400. S-400, yeah, the S-400, like an A-400 for some reason. The S-400, which I wasn't totally against. I just assumed that we took that one of those home with us and took it apart, but well, I sent people to look at it. Um, I don't know that for a fact. Uh, I don't know anything about it. But now you look at Turkey is fighting Russia and Libya. Turkey is fighting Russia and Syria. Turkey is fighting Russia and Armenia. If, if that's putting up, if that's wedge and negotiate, they really screwed that one up. Uh, Turkey sees itself as a regional great power, and it's got an economy the size of Russia. If it wants to, it can make this a horrendously hard fight. I remember what Winston Churchill said, Russia is never as weak or as strong as it appears. Um, when it's most frightening, it's probably brittle. When it looks weak, that's not the time to attack it. You know, Montgomery's first three rules of warfare. Never, t never march on Moscow, rule one. Yeah. If you do march on Moscow, never ever retreat, rule two. And three, do not put your army on the Asian mainland. It is not from Princess Bride. It's just real Marshal Montgomery. <laughs> You all sing Princess Pride, or is that getting too old? Yeah. Um, I list the old movies periodically, and I'm very appalled that my students don't don't watch TCM. <laughs> don't know who Mary Wally is or William Powell. Please tell me one of you know. No? I'm missing a lot of great movies that have been made over the years. Uh, And is, is the idea of competitive coercion, which he talks about, which we're running out of time. So I'm going to put my last thing here is in 21st century, in competition, do we have to repurpose alliances or alliance re re renovation? And if the answer is yes, then how or what? What do we have to do as the United States? Assuming our alliances are in our interest, because the day they're not, we won't we go home. What's what do we do? How do we how do we renovate them or reinvigorate them or repurpose them if we have to? 
I mean, it's it defined competition, defined that gray zone that, that is very ambiguous right now. I mean, we had efforts, I did the talent manual in the, in the cyber domain to try to figure out, hey, what is what is cyber law? What actions in the cyber domain are going to result in the can we, can we claim article by? Uh, I, I think the, the whole the whole gray zone is ambiguous right now to understand what the purpose of the alliance would be. It's a great article in there, so uh, lighten up the gray zone or something like that. Make it so we, we understand what it is. Um, on, go ahead there. On page 180, actually, it, it explicitly says that without drafting new laws or amending alliances, then the United States and its allies can legitimately identify non-military thresholds for collective defense. Non-military uh, thresholds for what? Collective defense. Non-military thresholds for collective defense. They say that, but it's an incredibly hard thing to do. Um, it's like the, the uh, vagueness as, as soon as we like set a, a, a tripwire, then they can go up to that tripwire to and, and test us on it. Right. Or they can send a proxy over the tripwire and see how serious we are. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not a believer in this idea of proxy wars. I don't. I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't look at. The, I don't think the Russians planned Vietnam for us. I think we just stumbled into ourselves, and the alliance has got behind it. I can't see any place during the Cold War where somebody said, you know what, I'm going to start a fight in Angola and suck Americans into it, or I'm going to suck Cubans into it. That these were all fights that happened anyway. Um, that just the alliance, the, the, the two uh, um, competitive powers got involved in. I can't, and they, Dr. Weber, maybe you know one where somebody actually said, I'm going to launch a proxy war against my enemy. In the last hundred years, uh, that seems like a very difficult trivia question. <laughs> just because they don't yeah. launch it doesn't it, mean that it's not. It, that's not possible. Yeah, but I mean, just because they're not the initiator doesn't right. mean that they're not still fighting the proxy war. So yeah, I mean, but proxy has got the definition that they that someone's doing this to us as part of a strategic plan of theirs. When it's for a strategic adaptation. But you oh, are, but you could be getting strategic gains out of Oh yeah, yes. The Russians went into Afghanistan. We didn't make them do that. Now we, then we started using the Afghanis as our proxies. But it was an adaptation. I, I'm, I'm at a loss. To, but I, as I said at the beginning of the Falklands campaign, told Russia, you know, if I send a billion dollars down to the Falklands, I might be able to encourage that. Uh, Argentina, I might be able to encourage them to try that again. Um, that, that you know, that there could be an instance where you do a proxy. Um, maybe you have two American allies or associated powers slug it out with each other. You get Philippines and Vietnam disputing South China Sea rights, and you pit them as part of the strategy. But because I have not seen a proxy war, I tried to discount that, that stuff, that, a pre-planned proxy war, I start to discount that as a real threat to us. What I do see is fights starting all over the place that suck us in. And I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not sure we've been incredibly careful about which ones we want to be sucked into, which ones we don't. And Russia the same way. They, they've been sucked into fights that they probably should Maybe it would be better for their long-term welfare if they didn't allow themselves to get sucked in. But countries will do dumb stuff. And remember, the number of people making these decisions is frighteningly low. World War I, they're probably between all of the great powers that went into war, Austria, Russia, Germany, Britain, France, there was probably not much more than a dozen people involved in the decision process combined that took, took the, the all of Europe into war. And Kennedy, if Kennedy and Khrushchev had gone to war, started World War III, the amount of people in the decision process would probably number less than 20. The Congress, the Senate, the American people, these great wars, these, these shifting, these movements of alliances are done by a frighteningly small number of people. In the Cold War, you had the, the wise men, the five or six guys out there that were influencing policy all the time. But at the top of the decision cycle, 
frighteningly small. And the reason you study this is you might be the colonel on the wall who says, Mr. President, can you step back here and listen to me? And he might take a minute. He might say, Colonel, get the hell out of the room. Uh, but <clears throat> you, you would be amazed at the power of one person at the right spot because he doesn't have to convince Congress or the Senate. He's going to convince one or two people. Our alliance is often rest on one or two people who like each other. Uh, the, after the Carter years, the, um, our relationship with England was, the United Kingdom was at a low point. Reagan and Margaret Thatcher liked each other, honestly liked each other. That, that's what brought it back. Now it's after Obama and Trump, it's at a nadir again. You know, person, personalities count in alliances and in war. Never underestimate them. The second part of that is never attribute to some great strategic plan that could be accounted for by dumbness and stupidity. I'm channeling my inner Wick Mary here. Anybody in Wick Mary's book group or any of that kind of thing? WS guys? No. I don't have anything else on my two little cards here. So I'm up, up to questions, answers. Someday someone's going to invite me in to do one of these on military history, which I really know a lot about. Yeah. Nothing? About that uh, topic. So, um, Tom gets hit on a lot because he's basically wanting to kill all these alliances or, you know, economic, do these new economic stations um, and alliances and whatnot. Here's my question. So, what is better? Is it better to have somebody like him who's doing that and is being honest and brutally honest about it to the point where it's almost uh, painful? Um, or is it better to have somebody who's weak in the alliances and doesn't follow through on the promises that we're making? They're both horrible. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, the French, the French president actually asked about the Obama. Is he weak? They, they were scared. Um, uh, but there is a strong network underneath these guys. No matter what Trump wants to do, he has not been able to walk away from NATO yet. Um, that's, that is one of the best things about the alliance. Alliance is a treaty. It's got to be signed off on by the Senate. Getting out of it has got to be approved by the Senate. Also, um, you know, it, it's hard. It, it makes it once a little bit harder to amend. Now, we've had, we've had uh, eight, 16, 20 years of miserable leadership. It's time to, uh, it's time to elect me. No. <laughs> uh, Colonel Jackson had one last question, and it was, we've talked about who we should be friends with, Colonel Jackson, who we should be friends with, who we should not be friends with, um, or maybe I misinterpreted, but who do we need that we don't have yet? Sorry, it was, we, we know who we're friends with. We know who we're enemies with. Who do we need that we're not? We don't have yet. I think that was request. Mr. Gunny and his enemies actually. Well, you got to remember, all this, none of this is in a vacuum. Anyone who thinks China and Russia are going to be friends forever is fool. That's a transactional get together. Ever I saw. One. Who would I love to be friends with that we're not friends with now? I don't know. I think I think every you, when you look at who Russia and China are friends with, it's like why do you always have to be friends with the scummy nations, Iran and you know uh, you know in the old days with you? It's because they don't have anything that appeals to the others. You know, it's India, China, where uh, India, China, not China, India, all the countries surrounding China are with us. I guess what I'd really like to see. Is a is bringing Russia back into the U.S. fold? I, I thought I thought Russia was up for grabs after the Cold War if we had handled it properly. What does Russia wants in the big scheme of things is respect. It doesn't want to take over the Baltics, it, you know, because it, that costs money. It, 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 you know, owning that empire cost them a lot more than it was coming in. They just want a mother may I. They don't want the Baltics continually poking them in the eye and see, that, see what Russia does. I think Russia's at heart 
a nation that looks west, and there there is going to be in the post-Putin world another shot at bringing Russia deeper into the Western world. We have too many things we want to do in common to continue to look at each other with thousands of nuclear weapons and a 2,000-mile on board. Uh, some of our fights have been horrendous and dumb. We weren't ready to do it after the Cold War. They weren't ready. Um, yeah, I don't know that we can do it with Putin. I don't know that we can do it with our current Eva Biden or Trump. But I, I, we had a window. I think that window is going to open again before I'm dead. And I hope we make much better use of it. There was no reason to start another Cold War with Russia. Because the Russians look over that border. They see their population decreasing. They see all those resources in eastern Russia. They see China eyeing them covetously. They see China moving into, with the One Belt Road, into Central Asia, to rebuild the Silk Road, which is what Russia's domain. Russia might be holding hands with China right now because the, 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 the common cause against us, they can't hold up. And they, they may come a day. It's a Tom Clancy novel in the, written back in the, right after the Cold War where we come to China, Russia's aid to fight China. Um, it was unbelievable. It's still a great story. But uh, if there was one country I think is we can eventually bring them to the Western fold, it is Russia. And we should do it. We should bend over backwards to do that. I don't know if Dr. Weber agrees. That would put you out of a job, wouldn't it, Dr. Weber? <laughs> no, the thing about Russia specialists is we're very flexible. <laughs> we just change the, the proper nouns, and, you know, now we're against China instead of being against Russia. So, it, it, don't worry. It's very easy for me. Um, All right, I'm, good. Okay. So I, you know, I might call the whole thing off if I knew you were going to personally affect it in a negative way. <laughs> no, so certainly when we when we think about Russia as potentially U.S. ally, the Russians themselves have always put basically the U.S.-Russia relationship as their own holy grail. But what they want in return, and sorry about the construction noise, is they want the Western, so European American acceptance of basically the kleptocracy at home and sort of that the Russian economy, Russian society, Russian politics will not be Western in any way that the Western states usually require out of their allies. So when we think about the European Union or NATO or basically anything having to do with the U.S. and Europe, it's, you know, these organizations are open to new members as long as the new members change everything about themselves to essentially be EU or U.S. compliant. That's what Russia is willing to not do. So if we were willing to say we're willing to live with the Russia that exists rather than the Russia that we want, then essentially uh, Putin t the next day would be selling out the Chinese for uh, everything that they're worth in order to get basically the ability to maintain Russian autonomy without changing anything about the way that he rules his own country. It's going to be another window. It doesn't mean we have to let them into NATO. It doesn't mean they, have, they join the EU. It just means we we get to look at West again. It'd be, be an interesting discussion. We should write an article on that someday. Well, I, I think we, we have a, a Russia class coming up, a Russia class meeting coming up in a couple of weeks, so perhaps we'll prepare one ahead of that time. Um, yeah, right after I finish my book. Yeah, me too. Um, so overcommitted. Um, unless you have something else, Dr. Weber, I'm done. So let me be the first to thank you, Dr. Lacey, for um, overseeing a tremendous conversation. And I think what we got out of here was a lot of food for thought, not just in terms of thinking about what does the U.S. think about alliances, but also the discussions we've had about two things which will be very consistent throughout the rest of the year, which is what are the different ways that different hegemons, different great powers actually pursue their own hierarchical orders, their own alliances, their own spheres of influence. What we've seen from the United States and what we'll see when thinking about, um, you know, next week, 
we'll have a much more, or next month, we'll have a much more pessimistic view when we have Dan Nex and Alex Cooley talk about their book, Exit from Hegemony. Uh, but then also thinking about China, thinking about Russia, and thinking about the other um, course meetings, or the other class meetings over the rest of the year, is that all these countries are basically making it up as they go along. And they do things in order to get their own spheres of influence as big as possible, not just because they want more countries on their side, because allies are always nice, but they also want to deny those allies to the other potential hegemons um, that they may encounter in terms of great power conflict. So one thing that I want everyone to sort of think about when think, when thinking about exit from hegemony is, as Dr. Lacey put it, none of this happens inside of a vacuum. So how do you compare the U.S. style of, a, of alliance construction and maintenance compared to let's say, the, the, the traditional, let's say, Biden version, the more uh, transactional and homeland defense-oriented uh, Trump version, as well as how do the Chinese do it? How do the Russians do it? Um, we're going to see that there's a lot of ways to practice international politics over the course of the year. And that's basically what we'll see um, for the next uh, class meeting when we talk about exit from hegemony. So once again, thank you to Dr. Lacey. Thank you to all the people who are tuning in virtually. Thank you to all the people who came in person. And thank you to all the people who are watching this um, from the, the safety and comfort of their own homes. Um, two parts. Sure. The only worst than fighting with allies is fighting without them. Churchill. And if you don't take care of your allies, they will go away. Done. It, done. So it's how do you make friends and influence people international version? That's right. All right. So happy trails. Uh, catch up with you guys soon enough. All right. Thank you, Dr. Weber.